on the roll ski. Alright, Bonnie and Terror, scene 66 PP, take three, no audio. Take one. Three, two, one, action. And cut. Ah, man. Hey, Christopher Moonlight, after a day of shooting, just want to take you around a second. This is what the set looks like after everyone's gone home. Hello, my Indiegogo supporters. So, switching over to narration track for this. What you were looking at were just some of the clips behind the scenes from uh, the making of the Quantum Terror. But anyway, um, if you're an Indiegogo supporter, or maybe you just got a comp copy, or maybe you found this in a, I don't know, like a Goodwill or something like that, uh, at least this movie is living on through there. It's doing pretty well. Uh, we're on video on demand at the time of this recording to be filmsy and amazon soon but uh anyway this is especially for you my indiegogo supporters i wanted to talk about the making of the quantum terror and uh, i'll probably do more making of later down the line if this movie continues to be popular but uh yeah i just wanted to talk about the making of this film the journey that i was on you know started with a script with some storyboards i was uh really kind of moved to make this movie after a long time of, of uh, having stories in my mind. Kind of started out when I was a teenager. I was, uh, you know, I love movies like the Aliens franchise, The Thing, um, Ghost Stories, a lot of supernatural stuff, anything with monsters. I mean, it was really, you know, I love monsters. I always kind of was a little disappointed if the monster turned out to be just a serial killer or something like that, you know. Not that there aren't good movies like that as well. I think one of the movies that really influenced my style of directing for The Quantum Terror was Silence of the Lambs. Um, but even Hannibal Lecter was his own kind of monster. Uh, anyway, so as you can see, you know, I spent a lot of time on the script, numbering it, drawing out sequences. I really had a vision in my head of what I wanted the movie to look like. And I wanted to be able to show that to my director of photography, Anthony Gutierrez, show it to the actors, uh, show it to anyone else helping so they knew what they were doing. And uh, I didn't lose track of my vision as well. You know, you're, you're writing and you're imagining things and you're framing stuff up when you're building the set. And you, you know, you have these ideas, and if you don't do something to get them out in a visual way pretty quickly, they disappear, and so you're flying blind otherwise. Anyway, uh, you know, this is, uh, this was a, th a fun process, too, and it was kind of nice to, to be able to show this stuff to everyone and have them go you know, wow, this is what we're doing? <laughs> the fact that I drew them at all was amazing to them. Um, you know, they're just quick sketches, but it, it's also a way to, to show the actors, you know, uh, because it was, and, and this is something I'm going to talk about more. There's a lot of getting the actors to do different things and having them just kind of look at you like, why am I doing this? What What's this going to look like when it's done? You know, because a lot of times there was just a green screen 
or I was asking them to do something in reverse, uh, which, you know, you saw at the beginning of this. So, yeah, it just kind of, it was a way to get everyone to, to get on board of what they were consenting to um, and, and understanding that even though at the time of doing certain things in front of the camera, it seems silly or ridiculous, uh, you know, later on uh, down the road, it would become what you see in the movie. So anyway, there, there was a lot of that. It was a lot of visualizing the script and uh, yeah, and a lot of, you know, concept artwork, things that were more refined. Um, not all the ideas made it to screen. Some of these images that you're seeing right now were actually used as uh, drawings on the walls, which were put in using VFX later on. And then it kind of came down to building the set in my garage, which was just styrofoam sheets, um, you know, and, and we kind of did the Star Trek thing where people would just repeatedly run down the same tunnel over and over again, and then we would supplement it with miniatures. The actors, Kristen Koschel and Matt Blackwell, were good enough to come along and, and kind of help me test things out before I went too far and, and kind of finish things you know we were able to visualize what they would look like in front of the camera what the angles would look like they were they were awesome and i couldn't have asked for a better cast i'm going to talk about that more so once they did that we you know got paint and sand and <laughs> instant coffee crystals and spray bottles and uh, just kind of went to work with just like watering things down and splattering stuff all over the, the board so it looked like uh, like concrete and uh, it was actually so successful I haven't had anybody question while watching the movie uh, <laughs> what the sets were made out of uh, and even to the degree the, you know the actors had to kind of remind themselves sometimes not to lean against the walls because their brain was telling them it was concrete and they would start to lean against it and it would just buckle in. So there were a lot of what I call garbage bag tests, which is reference to how they tested the Alien Queen for aliens before they built it. They kind of just did a structure covered in, in trash bags. And I wanted to see how uh, things worked in reverse, different puppets. This particular puppet didn't make it into the movie. It was actually built for some other project I was working on, but I thought I might work it in. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that we did that looked really cool, like this here, uh, underwater green screen puppet. I, I just, I couldn't work it into the story in a way that didn't feel clunky, but... This was inspired by the Rod Puppet in Alien 3, and as you can see with this test here, you know, it kind of looked convincing. Um, testing out the tentacles that ADI sent us. Yes, Studio ADI, Alec Gillis and Tom Woodruff Jr., thank you so much. A professional special effects company actually contributing. Um, here's Matt doing a, a puppet test, uh, kind of back to the drawing board for this one. Uh, didn't quite work out. There was a false arm, and he was controlling the creature with his hand. Some reverse photography. This was like one of the very first tests I did with just a cardboard poster tube <laughs> and uh, some bubble wrap and me against a green screen. Kind of effective, you know, different things. That's a that's a straw with a fishing line down it, just trying to be like a creature tentacle. Um, and then we started to get into, you know, really building stuff. This was... Uh, one of the puppets that we actually used um, to kind of have the mandibles snapping at people. Um, we actually had the Jabberwocky be several different puppets. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk about that more later. Tentacle mechanisms that I made, you know, just using household materials, foam core, springs, fishing line. Um, you know, it actually came to some use. And again, it was a lot of experimenting. Everything I'm Not everything I made got used, but it was fun making it. And I think the journey kind of really informed what we finally came to. That's not to say that I wouldn't do things different now. You know, everything was a learning experience. This was all trial and error. I never went to school for any of this stuff. Not for special effects, not for filmmaking. It was all tutorials and... Um, YouTube videos, Stan Winston School of Character Arts, um, you know, having a relationship again with uh, Alec and Tom at, at uh, Studio ADI or Amalgamated Dynamics Incorporated. 
you know, everything. Just all these behind the scenes that I would watch through the years. You watch it and you you know the stories you personally want to tell and you get to learning how other people did what they did and uh, you, your brain starts to go, well, well, how would I use these tools? And you really have to think in terms of just, you know, your limitations. I think a lot of people try and tell stories based on, you know, they want to write a script and then they want unlimited resources to realize that. And I actually feel like you have to work the opposite. You have to figure out what you have available to you. And yeah, you may see people with nicer toys, more money, doing things that are really cool. And you want to do that too. But you know, in a way I think like, what if, you know, what if I was working for Roger Corman in like the 1950s and I had this stuff at my disposal that I do, that I do have at my disposal. And, uh, you know, he asked me to make something. I'd probably make something greater than what was seen on screen then, or even up to the eighties, you know, in some respects in the low budget respect, but you know, it's about being able to tell the story and, and, uh, understanding that your uh, movie is a series of scenes and scenes are a series of cuts and if you can cut together some cool stuff based on what you're creating um, or what you have available to you you can tell a very compelling story and I think the best filmmakers always know that um, that's certainly what I learned from James Cameron in Aliens anyway here's me uh, the baby Jabberwocky where I actually took Sculpian Springs and, and uh did a tentacle mechanism and latex. Again, I probably could do this better now using different techniques. Sometimes you fall in love with the technique and you're like, I gotta use this. And then there are easier ways to do it that you didn't think of. And you know, when I make the next movie, which is um, what I'm working on right now, uh, should I say the name of it? No, I won't because I'm making announcements and who knows what'll come to pass and someone's watching this later on down the road and they're like, wait, he didn't do that. Yeah things change but uh anyway what i'm working on right now is employing a lot of these techniques but kind of a hundred times better not based on what i have available to me but based on what i learned um this character is fun this is actually supposed to be i don't know if this is supposed to be the final form of um noah the idea originally was that the tentacle came out of his chest and and it became so heavy it kind of split down his body as the gravity drew it down and here's the studio adi tentacle you know this is the kind of quality you know professional level productions have and i was lucky enough to have it in my film so i'm very grateful to uh alec and tom uh it's really rad and jenna put the skin on it um by the way shout out to jenna green who helped me with all of this stuff really adding her professional level makeup skills this i put the adi tentacle mechanism in the puppet and i tried to make it work and it looks really cool but again it wasn't really feasible with all the strings and stuff it was just too noisy and there'd be too many things to erase one of the puppets or that's the puppet that was underwater before so uh yeah i think that's cool and here's jenna's we called this mildred or mildred and this is the puppet that comes after people in the vertical tunnel when they're kind of climbing away and it kind of comes through so here's what that looks like without all the color grading and the uh the visual effects added i i did add more tentacles to it in post and i uh did some visual effects magic to the mouth to make it look like it was actually pulsating and moving looks pretty cool on its own uh, again, one of the things I regret is maybe, you know, editing in a way where we got to see it just a little bit more. But, you know, here's one of the things about special effects. The longer you linger on it, the more your audience has time to kind of realize that they're looking at a, a puppet or a visual effect. So, but you fall in love with this stuff, and I'm glad I'm, be, uh, I'm able to show it to you here. So, you know, of course, the actors, they had to... Uh, you know, play along with what was in the script without seeing this stuff, you know. I didn't have a full-size Mildred uh, on the set coming after them. We just had a couple of tentacles, and uh, here I employed a trick that I actually learned from uh, John Carpenter and Dan O'Bannon's Dark Star. Dan O'Bannon was a great visual effects uh, person as well as a writer. 
by the way, and you know, before he did Alien, he did Dark Star. So they did a scene where they just had someone coming down an elevator shaft and they flipped it around so you didn't realize that the actor was actually just laying on the ground, that actor being Dan O'Bannon. So you felt like he was trying to like cling on for dear life. So I just had the, uh, you know, the actors <laughs> lying on the floor and again they're going like what are you doing they had great faith in me it takes a lot of trust uh and a lot of goodwill to uh to tell people to lie on the ground on these styrofoam sets and crawl around and pretend like they're trying to climb down and just say hey trust me we're gonna just we're gonna flip the image around and it's gonna look like you know you're defying gravity, but the brain is going to go, oh, they're climbing down. So, you know, again, he's just asking Kristen, like, just lay on the ground and kick around and act like it's killing you, <laughs> to, to quote uh, Johnny Depp as Ed Wood. Um, and they really went for it. Man, they were fantastic. Here, Kristen is, is jumping, literally just jumping, doing jump squats to give the illusion that she's falling. Rolling. And uh, that, you know... Uh, I, I took several cuts of that together to make it look like she was like dropping down a long tunnel. No sound. And uh, again, just a series of cuts. You see that series of cuts, and and you know there it is. And then I say, hey, Kristen, you're going to be an alternative version of yourself. You're going to be your evil twin sister, sort of. If you watch the movie, you know what I mean by that. And you're going to crawl on the floor, but we're going to flip the image upside down. And we're gonna make it look like uh, you're you're actually crawling on the ceiling. And again, look at her; she just went for it. And uh, you know, Kristen, as far as I know, has actually decided to retire from acting. And uh, I don't know why. Um, you know, her choice, obviously. Okay. Um, and I think she's uh, enjoying her life, so good for her. But man, take this is someone that really committed to all of these things that okay, ready? on and the day, on action. the set, must have seemed so ridiculous and Wait, so silly. And again, I just said, look, trust me, this is what it's going to be like. We're going to flip the image upside down. And then she just goes for it, you know? The, the, look at her. She is really selling that character and, and giving it her all. Yeah. And, and God bless her for, you know... Just throwing herself into it and and becoming this kind of slinky, sensual, evil character. Um, I, I'm really blessed, and I'm really proud of her and and the rest of the crew. Here's Curry. Uh, Curry was a contributor and came on set, and then Val Merrick, who's about to step in, who is uh, best known as co-creator of Howard the Duck. Uh, but he's also an awesome Conan the Barbarian and uh, a Vampirella artist, really of that kind of uh, generation. Uh, if you're a comic book fan, you know what I mean. And you'll notice kind of to the, to the left, there's a, a light showing. So, you know, you'll see a little later on. I went in um, as uh, put my VFX hat on. And did a lot of paint outs, you know, extended walls, added graffiti on the walls, um, added doorways. If you're familiar with the final cut, on the right there should be a doorway that was put in using visual effects. And uh, yeah, here is uh, Jordan Michael Brinkman as Noah again. I had to go in and color grade this so it looked darker and I had to put graffiti all over the walls. And uh, again, I'm just like, hey, you guys are, you're looking at graffiti on the walls. You're, you're reading words on the walls. Trust me, they'll, it'll all be there later. And they trusted me. Um, and not only did they trust me, but they, you know, really believed in it and worked their asses off to sell it. So, you know, this is, this is not easy stuff. So here you go. Here's what I mean. Look at all that. I painted all that in. Walls, graffiti, that flashlight. I actually had them dip the flashlight down so I didn't have to work it <laughs> crossing over, uh, you know, from VFX to their actual flashlight beam. 
So uh, here we have a miniature, and this is the other aspect of it. Because the sets were so limited, um, I kind of um, was inspired by Silence of the Lambs to use the notion of, of looking through the character's eyes as they walk through settings. So, you know, we cut from them to, you know, if they're looking down a vertical tunnel, I couldn't actually afford to build a ver vertical tunnel set. So I just had them duck down beneath the camera and then I switched to their point of view. And then it looks like they're looking down a, a vertical tunnel. And then, you know, I actually built the vertical tunnel set, but as far as, you know, it leading from one thing okay, to another. Okay, so we have, uh, what is this, some, uh, breadcrumbs I mean, and look at flour this. and, uh, shaving cream. Yep. We're, uh, creating a, a water concoction for, uh, uh, a miniature effect of a tunnel flooding. So, uh, let's see if adding water to this does the trick. So yeah, I just uh, had a fish tank, so I put the cameras in the fish tank, To I put my cell phone and my uh, regular camera into a fish tank, so when the water rushed towards it through the miniature tunnel, it uh, <laughs> didn't damage them. And then I had to slow the foot down, because that water rushes to the camera really quick. Here's uh, the other camera. I don't know if you noticed that the eye was on the floor, like maybe the tunnels were flipping upside down themselves. Oh, that's right. Okay. And let's switch yeah. it to the other side, though. Switch the head to the other side of your neck. I'm scared. Yeah. Yeah. This might be a cute one, too. Okay. Except Sam's got to be behind her. God damn it. <laughs> okay, and one, two, three. So as you may have guessed, that shot was in reverse later, so it was attacking her. What good sports. You know, you're just acting against a green screen, and then, you know, we would do these visual effects elements that we would shoot separately. It was, you know, I didn't want to have Paula waiting around while we try and figure out how to puppeteer this thing while she held it. So I shot it separately, and then I had her, again, act things out. And she had to have complete trust in me that uh, it would look good. So we took that element and we placed it there. And then after that, it was uh, composited in properly. So Kristen would be walking in, or Sam, and that's what she would see. So again, I just really love that uh, <laughs> I get a chance to kind of linger on these effect shots for a moment we did things like add in drool and i say we i after the fact and here's some just nice shots of the puppets the baby jabberwocky mildred created by jenna jenna designed that uh that didn't quite get used it was like a i don't know jellyfish crab thing and then the high priest which got cloaked over because it looked too much like the <laughs> um the Demigorgon, which Stranger Things came out in the middle of us working on that, so I kind of had to rearrange things. Again, hey, just <laughs> lie on the sand with these dead fish and a green screen behind you, and uh, trust me, it'll look good in post. It's funny, I've gotten a lot better at uh, compositing things since then, so I probably would have done this scene a lot differently. I'm actually doing working on a movie right now called Brimstone Saint for the director Chris Young, and I did a much better Lovecraftian yeah, with Primordial yeah. Land. Audio but, rolling. You know, a lot of times, just, you hey guys, green screen. It'll look better <laughs> in post, trust me. Lay on the ground. We're going to act like the, the floor is turning into a wall and the flashlight slides away. I don't think we ended up using that shot. Or yeah, you're going to be attacked by a tentacle monster and, and pulled off into the darkness. So uh, just <laughs> jump up, act like you're being yanked back, and we'll do the rest in post. With the green screen removed. And then final comp. 
And then we had the uh, infamous bathroom scene. Was harmonizing. He took the harmony. What do you make of this scene? <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Cameras rolling. Again, asking uh, Kristen and Paula to yeah, be these characters. I mean, I know they read the script one, and knew that this scene was going to be in there, but, you know, really taking the risk and putting themselves out there uh, for such a salacious scene, um, you know, I really got to admire them. So, again, this is one of the ones that we shot backwards. So, you know, the tentacles look like they were kind of moving up. So we actually had them act in reverse, so they're kissing first, and then they turn and look at Noah. Kind of being like the uh, Babylonian <laughs> version of themselves. I think they were having fun. It's fun to be the bad character. Oh, I just wanted to throw this in here because this was the set and we actually just had a tray of water with some tin foil in it and someone sloshing the water around to give it that look of light bounce from water they're supposed to be walking in and then here's the cube scene uh you know i i lined up the camera and i had a monitor so i could see what i was drawing and i just matched the perspective of the uh the chalk drawing so that it was this flat image that was stretched out when it was on the table and then uh, we could replace it with the actual cube and then walk around it and see it in 3D. What do you think that's supposed to mean? I mean, I know, but I'm not telling. Yeah. Again, it was uh, uh, trying to achieve this look and researching it came from, you know, looking at a lot of his artwork, um, which is really, really weird stuff. It's very cool. Um, so looking at a lot of that stuff and then realizing, you know, we have, you know, our Zeiss 85, mil 85 millimeter with, you know, 1.4. We got a Tokina. We got some 50 millimeters that are really nice lenses um, that give these great depth of fields. And, you know, we're limited with the lighting that we have. You know, it's just a couple of soft boxes. Um, today I was lucky. I got some Kinos. Uh, maybe a 1K, so uh, might be able to incorporate them. So with you know, it's just taking really what we have, applying it as best as we can in camera to get that vision, and then from that point on, it's uh, all Christopher fixing everything I did wrong in post. So. How important was your camera selection? It's probably not wouldn't have been camera my camera of choice but because we're shooting over an extended period of time on weekends you know i'm from dallas everyone else is from houston austin area um so it's like every couple of weeks we get or every few once a month every weekend you know we get together to shoot this so renting a camera such as a c300 maybe a red or something like that is just out of budget so you know, he owned a 7D. It was a camera that he had. I had some good lenses, um, capturing really good audio, and then the rest is all, you know, done in post. So that was what we had in our hands to accomplish that look. And uh, we're just trying to make the best of it as, as we can, especially with the miniatures. Um, I'm very eager to try to make miniatures um, and forced perspective uh, with lenses and, cam and the lenses that we have, I'm, I'm really eager to try and uh, see how that's going to turn out. So, uh, because I couldn't travel back and forth from Dallas to Austin for all the shoots, because some of the guys really live close by, um, Christopher ended up shooting some of those scenes. Now I've got to go and match eye angles and color and um, I have to try to match as, as much as possible what he shot, which is difficult. What we'll do is we'll do a shot of you guys all walking over to the tunnel. We're going to get a reverse of you guys all walking up. So remember you walked up before, mm -hmm. do a reverse of you guys all walking up. We'll all stand, look at each other. So yes, of course, Anthony is uh, right. I had to really... Pull, uh, 
pull a lot of scenes together without him and without his advice. And uh, it, things were definitely better with him around to uh, coordinate the shoot and get the lighting right and the color and all that sort of thing. But he was fantastic. Um, the whole cast and crew were fantastic. So, you know, you can see us here. I really wanted to kind of give you this look at just what life was like on the set, which was my house. Um, the power would weirdly just it is, go off we don't and then come back power. on. <laughs> little battery LED. Oh my God. <laughs> that. We had a really good time. You know, this is something that I really want to emphasize is, uh, you know, everyone came to the table, my wife included. She played the eye at the beginning of the movie um, and throughout, actually, with the visual effects. But, uh, yeah. Everyone came to the house. Everyone had a good time. They were wonderful. Like I said, they gave it their all. They really threw themselves into the parts. I think they enjoyed their work immensely. And there was just a, an atmosphere of, of goodwill and good faith uh, among everybody, everyone got along. Yeah, just go um, right there. Met, you know, just nobody like, copped an attitude or tried to be a prima donna. They were very professional, but we had fun. Mm -hmm. I'm is it ahead? Yeah, go ahead and step over from the couch. Just reach in from over here. two different people play the hands of Noah for this scene because uh, there's no way one person could reach around Anthony reach and the in. camera to Noah? choke Paula. <gasps> Again, this is another example of just, you know, having real faith in uh, what I was doing as a filmmaker. It's like, come into the garage as a black sheet, act in front of it like you're you're lost in an endless void. And, uh, you know, you have to trust that we're going to be able to frame it in the camera so the audience is convinced of that. So play to it. This, uh... Brent Dickerson, who showed up for free and volunteered to do all sorts of things to help, and he had a great time. And there's that tentacle I was working on before in a cardboard harness. Hey, we do things really low budget. <laughs> we ended up not using it um, in favor, of course, of the ADI one, but, you know, it, it might have made a good interstitial tentacle, kind of, uh, in terms of beginning to kind of develop out of them. I don't know. Maybe I regret not using it a little bit because it was a fun little piece. There's Jenna Green in the background. Makeup artist extraordinaire. Cast going over their script is, uh, they wait. Actors are always good at waiting. Waiting in makeup chairs. <laughs> waiting on couches. Yeah. They can just say their lines, and you can, we can just kind of pan around as they talk. Okay, good. Um, I think that'll help things go a lot quicker. Anyway, um, do you want to block this real quick? Can we go to the same yeah. the way on um, Yeah, sure. You guys feel... Is this the first one we're shooting, or are we shooting the... Uh, we're shooting the tentacle one. scene first, but this is the first, like, real dialogue okay. scene that we have. Can we read for the scene? So, do you have... Your stuff's over here. She's just saying, oh, yeah. Scene. So this is like that thing too. Oh, no, we're blocking that. Okay, yeah, so that's what I was going to say. That's really easy to do. Can I have a hug? Very nice, lady. One hand. I can see you. How are you? Yeah. And then 
like you sit. Yeah. You? Yeah. And you? I, I could, yeah. Well, I mean, because like, here, yeah. put your okay. go both on me. Right you here. don't have So here's one thing. Line. You snake yeah. under. Yeah. yeah, that's the that's, that's problem. Something like that. Yeah. Or yeah. Or something. yeah. Exactly. I'm glad you know what you're doing. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Did you just record that? How is this Some of it, yeah. All right. On and off. No, this is my last. Staring at the door. Staring at the door. Yeah. Action. Which bathroom in this place you need to take a leak? It's at the top of the stairs. And then, but when you, the next, when we get ready to roll and you go up those stairs, stay close to this, as close as you can this way. Oh, okay. So that we mm -hmm. see more of you. Oh, yeah, okay. we only saw the top of your head. At what point when he's on the stairs? As close as you like can, that. even she didn't lean over. Really, there's a confrontation going from these two points between Lucy and Jacob, where she's like, I'm on to you, kind of a situation. So I want to shoot over Jacob's shoulder for when she's doing confronting them and I want to be kind of at his level so that she can kind of bend down yeah. and like put her hand on the table. So this is the part where, you know, once again I, if I haven't already said it, it's a very special time. Um, not just the fact that I got to make my first feature film, but, you know, for a little while there, we became, a, you know, a, a little, like, acting troupe yeah. unit. I don't want to go as far as, say, family, because these people all have families of their own, and I have my family, but it was a real special time. They gave their all. We all had a really good time. Um, you know, <laughs> animals were hanging out. And uh, this is something that, I wish, uh, well, I'm glad to be able to share more with my Indiegogo supporters um, times like this. And, uh, you know, all I can say is if you had been there, you would have thought it was really cool, not just because we were making a movie, but everyone was having a good time together and, and uh, you know, lunch breaks, you know, eating together, laughing together, coming up with ideas together. Um, you know, people just generally inspiring one another, you know, with bouncing ideas. kind of funny looking back at this now because I've had the movie in the edit for so long I wasn't really thinking about it in terms of you know what we were doing on the day it starts to kind of become clips of what's happening in the story and how to put them together in a way that uh, creates the story What did you all think of this scene, by the way? What do you think it meant? What caused Noah to transform into this thing? Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I missed it. Oh, yeah. God. Can we uh, rewind that part? Yeah. Oh, man. Woo. Do you want to watch that? That's how yeah. you know one. It was always cool watching the scenes back and seeing people mm -hmm. react to them as well. That was kind of, yeah, you know, that's really a good part about it is the actors when when there was a time there wasn't always times where I could show the actors what the finished result was going to be until it was in the edit but if there were times that we could do a playback and the actors could see exactly what we were going for it was kind of gratifying because it you know it proved to them not that they didn't believe me but you know it, it, it still it kind of proved the concept to them of what they were doing and kind of gave them the uh the knowledge in what they were doing to <clears throat> to to keep going and keep pushing the boundaries of their performances so you know 
And then we did a we did a screening. It was an outdoor screening at uh, at Bat City Scaregrounds, um, and a few of the actors showed up. It was that Matt and uh, Jordan showed up? And uh, not that they hadn't seen screeners before that I, they had sent them, but when it was up on the screen, you know, they're going like, "Wow, this is." You know, to think that was all in your house and in a garage, and, and it turned into a whole underground world. So, uh, that's it. Thank you so much, everybody, for being a part of this movie, and I, I hope you're proud of it, and I hope you continue to, uh, to be so, and to, to continue to let people know that this is uh, a movie that you were a part of. And it's cool. Independent horror films scare the living poop out of my bunghole, <laughs> which is why I don't watch them. I, so I didn't feel comfortable saying shit or ass. So, uh, so uh, Chris generally watches all the horror films that film threat. I want, I want you to know Alan wrote that joke. <laughs> he's, he's the one that wrote bunghole. <laughs> Uh, no, that's actually true. Alan hates blood. Uh, and on that note, let's take a look at the nominees for indie horror. Close your eyes, Alan. Let me see your teeth. Oi vey. Told you. No friends, no beginning, no end No particular anomalies Cut my space and tap my energies Take my weapon before I forget I'll do something that we both do It's not like me to right down to the little black dot on the tip of his nose. You're really weird, you know that? I believe him. This award, this award go for indie horror. <laughs> I never get that right. Oh goes to, wait, oh, wait, wait. oh, what, what? No, go all on, right, go. it's a tie. <laughs> <laughs> Our first winner is Wormhole. Nope. I don't know where they went. Another no show. <laughs> uh, the se what? Oh, the second winner is the Quantum Terror. I know you're here. So uh, first they ignore you, and then they laugh at you, and then they fight you, and then you win. <laughs> it's true. Um, I am very nervous. I first, I want to thank God just for making this thing we call reality and deciding that I could exist in it. <laughs> I want to thank my family, my wife, my daughters, who are my partners in this. I want to thank Chris and Alan. Because, and I want to thank uh, Michael Talbot Haynes for writing such a wonderful review. I want to thank my cast, Kristen Koschel, Paula Solinger. Um, I am really nervous. Um, Matt Blackwell, Demetrius Polito, Val Merrick, 
uh, and Jordan Michael Brinkman for uh, just turning in wonderful performances, Anthony Gutierrez, and uh, who's my director of photography. Oh, I am Christopher Moonlight Cooksey, and I <laughs> created, wrote, directed, produced the Quantum Terror, did the special effects for. Um, Tom Woodruff Jr. and Alec Gillis of Studio ADI for believing in me enough to loan me some of their very professional practical effects. Um, and just saying, you know, we had, a re we had people coming from all walks of life all genders, sexualities, uh, and they all had two things in common. One, they didn't have brain rot, so I could trust them to not destroy me for trying to make this, which is happening a lot these days, I'm sure you all have noticed. And the other thing is they gave it their all, um, and that's what we really need to do as filmmakers now. It's not good enough anymore to rest on the laurels of what came before. We need to give it our all. I am so grateful for this. Thank you very much. It, I am so honored. This is so important. Thank you again, guys. And also, we love you, Ellen. And rest in peace, Chris Gore Soulpatch.